Good afternoon. My name is Kieran Hostey. And I'm the manager of the Maritime Archaeology Program at the Australian National Maritime Museum in Sydney, Australia, and your host for this afternoon's presentation, Rediscovering South Australia, a graphic tale of shipwrecks. I begin today by acknowledging the Eora Nation, traditional custodians of the land on which I stand, and I pay my respects to their elders, past and present. And I extend that respect to all Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. This afternoon, we'll be hearing from Dr. James Hunter and Professor Holger Deuter on a graphic new method of interpreting shipwrecks. Notice the pun. The presentation will start with James providing some historical and archaeological background to the South, South Australian shipwreck, which was the inspiration for the graphic novel. This will be followed by James and Holger discussing how the graphic novel came about. During the presentation, if you have any questions you'd like to ask James or Holger, please use the Q&A icon function on the Zoom. And the presenters will try and answer your questions towards the end of today's session. Now for our first speaker. Dr. James Hunter is the museum's curator of Naval Heritage and Archaeology. He received his MA in Historical Archaeology from the University of West Florida. His accent gives it away. And he holds a PhD in Maritime Archaeology from Flinders University in South Australia, where he's an associate lecturer in the Department of Archaeology. James has worked in the field of Maritime Archaeology for over two decades. You can tell by the nature of his hair, it's gone quite gray. That could be working with me, of course. And during that time, has participated in the investigation of shipwrecks and other archaeological sites, ranging from pre-European contact to the modern era. Now over to James. Thank you, Kieran, and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I would like to start uh, by acknowledging uh, that the beautiful town of Glenbrook in the Blue Mountains, from where I am speaking to you today, is located within the country of the Darug and Gundagura peoples. I also acknowledge all traditional custodians of the lands and waters throughout Australia and pay my respects to them and their cultures and to elders past, present and emerging. Well, thanks everyone for coming in today uh, to have a listen to this talk. Uh, as Karen has mentioned, uh, this is about a small little ship that was built in the early 19th century called South Australia. But it didn't start out as an immigrant ship. Uh, when it came to Australia in the 1830s, it brought some of the first free settlers to what is now South Australia. But it wasn't built for that purpose. In fact, it was built in 1819 at Falmouth and launched as a vessel called the Marcus of Salisbury. It was built as a postal packet. So the whole point of this ship was to deliver mail for the British Empire. Now, for an ocean-going ship, it was fairly small. It was only about 87 feet long but it had three masts and two decks. And one of the things about it was that for its size, it packed on an inordinate amount of sail. And the reason that it did that was so that it could get that mail from Great Britain or from wherever it was picking it up to wherever it needed to be delivered as quickly as possible. The vessel operated as a farm with packet from 1820 until 1824, at which point it was purchased by the Royal Navy it was renamed HMS Swallow and operated as a naval packet, so essentially doing the same thing, but for the Royal Navy until 1835. Now, this handsome devil here is Lieutenant Thomas Baldock. Now, he's important to this story because he was the owner and master of the Marcus of Salisbury. And as far as we know, he may also have had a role in the vessel's construction and design. He remained in command when the vessel transferred over to naval service and in fact rejoined the Royal Navy at that point. Uh, he later had a fairly distinguished career within the Royal Navy uh, after leaving uh, the Mark, uh, HMS Swallow when he became one of the first uh, steam packet commanders in the Royal Navy and eventually ended up as the superintendent of the Dover Packet Service. Now, Swallow was sold out of naval service in September 1836, at which point it was procured by the South Australian Company. Now, this was a mercantile outfit that was created in the United Kingdom with the sole purpose of developing a free colony in what is now South Australia. And in order to do that, they needed to transport immigrants to the uh, new colony. And this vessel was acquired for that purpose. 
It was renamed South Australian. It was refitted, re-rigged as a free immigrant transport and departed Plymouth in January 1837 for Nepean Bay at what is now known as Kangaroo Island. Now, an interesting thing about this vessel was that although it had brought immigrants to South Australia, that was not its primary purpose. Its primary purpose, once it dropped all the immigrants off Kangaroo Island, was to go over to nearby Rosetta Harbor and to act as a cutting in vessel. Now, this is a fairly unglamorous enterprise. What it did was it simply moored in a bay and was part of a shore based whaling station that existed at the cove. As whale carcasses were brought in after being uh, harpooned by the whalers, uh, South Australia basically functioned as a flensing platform. So they would haul the carcasses out using the ship's masts and they would flens the blubber off the whale carcasses. So it was rather nasty work, and it was a very unglamorous role that the vessel had uh, at the end of its life. Now, it was in the process of getting ready to depart uh, Rosetta Cove to head over uh, to Kangaroo Island and then on to Hobart uh, with a supply of uh, whaling uh, related equipment as well as produce that had been procured by the whaling station. And it was while it was moored in the bay on the 8th of December 1837 that it was caught in a severe southeasterly gale. Uh, the vessel was driven stern first over Black Reef, which was a reef that sort of bisected the bay uh, from east to west. And it ended up in shallow water where it heeled over on its port side and bilged. And at that point, the vessel was considered a complete loss. Surprisingly, there was no one lost on the ship. Uh, and there were three notable passengers who were on it at the time. One was David McLaren, who was the colonial manager for the South Australian Company. One was John Hahn Marsh Jr., who was the son of the then governor of South Australia. And one was John Jeffcott, who was one of the first uh, Supreme Court justices for the colony. There was some salvage that occurred in the wake of the wreck, but the lower hold was described as flooded and inaccessible. There was quite a lot of material still left on the ship at the time of its loss. Here are a couple of historic maps that show the vessel being lost. And this map in particular proved critical to the uh, discussion of the archaeology I'm about to get into, in that it showed basically where the wreck of South Australia should be located. And uh, it is one of the two small boat looking uh, sort of symbols roughly the middle left of the image, it's the top of those two. Ultimately, the ship broke up, sank below the waterline, and was forgotten. This is one of the last renderings of the vessel before it completely disappeared from view. So in the middle of this watercolor painting, you can see this weird object out in the water. That is actually the wreck of South Australia around 1841, so a few years after the wreck occurred. Now, in the 1990s, there were attempts by the South Australian uh, government to locate the wreck site. Those searches proved to be unsuccessful. However, they were useful in that they demonstrated where the wreck site wasn't. So when it came time for us to put our expedition together, it gave us a good solid place to start from. There was also uh, assistance from some of the elderly residents of Rosetta Harbor who recall swimming out to a shipwreck in the 1940s and recovering artifacts. And uh, while we weren't able to talk to some of these people, some of the South Australian government archeologists in the 1990s had spoken to them and had recorded their, their reminiscence. And we were able to use that information to help us try to sort out where the wreck site was. So the expedition to find the wreck site began in 2018 in April. It was a team comprising researchers from the South Australian Maritime Museum, the Silent World Foundation, South Australia's Department for Environment and Water, the Australian National Maritime Museum, Flinders University, and the MAP Fund. And the areas that we were searching in, you can see this grid in this image, um, we were searching that grid area. And we had numbered the grids according to the probability. Uh, so the highest probability was number one, and the lowest probability was number 12. Now we utilized all the archival information we had at hand. We had the information from the locals uh, who described swimming out to the shipwreck. And we used that prior 1990 survey data to help us 
whittle down where the most likely location of the wreck was. At the beginning of the project, we didn't have the best sea conditions. So we had to limit our work to inshore metal detecting. You can see some of that on the left-hand image. But eventually the seas laid down, we were able to get out there and we began to use a device called a magnetometer, which is a basically a glorified metal detector you tow behind the boat. And that's in the middle image there. We also did walkover surveys in the intertidal areas when the tide was out. And the sum total of all of this is that we eventually worked out where the wreck site was. And what's quite interesting is if you look at a plot of the metal detector survey, as well as the artifacts that we found in the shallows, uh, it whittled it down to grid one, which was the one we expected the wreck site to be in. And the best part was you could see a fan or a dispersal of material from the wreck site that basically pointed an arrow right to where the shipwreck should be. And this was the first thing that we saw. When we swam out, we were lucky in that the wreck site was starting to expose somewhat. And uh, I'll never forget it. I was working with my colleague, Irene Maliaris from the Silent World Foundation. We were swimming along in fairly shallow water in the early morning hours. It was probably about 6.37 in the morning. And she yells out, I've got pink tubes. And that was incredibly exciting for us. Uh, what the pink tubes were that she found were these copper bolts, uh, the keel bolts that were sticking up out of the sand. And as we began to swim around, we found articulated hull structure, framing, hull planking, and quite a lot of really nice preserved structure. So having found the wreck, we returned to the site in May and July of 2018. More of the site had uncovered, and that enabled us to begin to put together a composite site plan showing how much of the wreck site we had. Uh, so looking at this image, on the right is the bow structure, and on the left is the stern. And you can see that most of the site was buried, but we had a fair bit of articulated structure there. And that was really good news because that meant there was a lot of information we could get. We found various artifacts, including gun flints, ceramics, uh, hardware for a door and glass bottles, all of which dated to the 1820s and 1830s, which is the time period we expected. Then we did a final site survey in June 2019. So the image here, the bow of the wreck is actually in the foreground, and you can see two of the divers working there in the background in the bow setting. We took wood samples, uh, metal detecting, site survey, and we installed sediment monitoring stations so we could see how rapidly the site was exposing. We also did 3D photogrammetry, which enabled us to produce a 3D model of the bow section. And you can see it was quite extensive and very well preserved. This is a site plan of that bow section that we were able to develop in conjunction with the photogrammetry. And here you can see the bottom image shows the site as it appeared in June 2019, as opposed to how it appeared in April and May of 2018. And you can see quite a lot of sediment had been removed from it. This is actually a concern of ours because the site continues to expose and we do have concerns about preservation. So we are working with our project partners to develop a means that we can stabilize the wreck site moving forward. Again, a huge amount of artifacts, ceramics, glass, all of which are indicative of a vessel that wrecked in 1837. Looking at the hull remains and the artifacts and all of the other site features in their entirety, as well as the historical evidence that we have, we are confident that we have found the wreck site of South Australia. Its location and its disposition matches the archival accounts of the loss. The hull attributes that we look at are consistent with a British built early 19th century packet. There is evidence of lengthy service, which matches our historical understanding of the vessel, including repairs and modifications. And the diagnostic artifacts, including decorated ceramics and models, all date to the early 19th century. We also think we have some material evidence of whaling in the form of bricks and in the form of stave containers, such as barrels, which would have been used to uh, transport whale oil. Now, this brings me uh, <laughs> to the next part of our discussion. Uh, and that is, while we were working on this, uh, this project, um, I began working with my colleague Holger Deuter uh, from the University of Kaiserslautern. 
And we initially worked on a virtual reality shipwreck project together uh, because Holger has a background in, in 3D modeling and visualization. Um, we did that project and when we finished, uh, we were kind of thinking about other things that we could do together. And uh, I always thought it would be an interesting thing to do a graphic novel about a shipwreck uh, because I grew up reading comic books and graphic novels. I find them uh, a really compelling uh, medium for telling a story. And uh, in talking with Holger, um, he said, well, that's interesting because at the beginning of my career, I, I did comic book art. Um, so uh, this happened to sort of coincide with the, the pandemic, the COVID pandemic. Uh, both of us were at home. Uh, we couldn't really uh, do much uh, outside of what we could do at home. And so we started kind of working on this thing and it blossomed into what he and I will now uh, discuss here in just a moment. Uh, and so speaking of Holger, um, I'd now like to introduce my partner in crime on the graphic novel, Professor Holger Deuter. He is a multidisciplinary artist and researcher, working mainly in the fields of animation, virtual reality, and contemporary music. He is professor of virtual design at the University of Applied Sciences, Kaiserslautern, and a visiting scholar at the University of Technology, Sydney. His core interest is immersive storytelling, and he has explored this subject in award-winning projects by using cutting-edge technologies, as well as analog paint, drawing, and film tools. He is truly the epitome of a postmodern Renaissance man, at least to me, and I'm delighted he's taken the time to join us despite the early hour in Germany. Hey, Holger. Hello, all together. Hello, James. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invitation. And yeah, I'm in Germany. It's already eight o'clock or be it, uh, beyond uh, eight o'clock in the morning. And yeah, it's a pleasure to talk about our work our graphic novel work we have been developing now for yeah, at least uh, over a year. And yeah, it's a quite interesting project. And it's uh, for, my, for myself personally, uh, a very intense project as well, which I always wanted to realize uh, in the last time. So this was the opportunity to do it. Uh, and well, yeah, James and I, we have been working, as he said, on a virtual reality project that visualized uh, an ancient paddle wheel steamer uh, located in Sydney Harbor, which was quite successful. I did with my students, master students. It earned some awards and grants and stuff. And while we were working on this project, uh, we came up with the idea, James came up with the idea we could uh, work on a graphic novel and yeah, I don't want to talk too long about, we can see uh, one of our sources, which is the logbook, the second logbook of the box of Australian. Uh, and it describes uh, the time uh, in December uh, 1837, when the ship was destroyed in a gale and the efforts of the seafarers to save their lives and their ships, yeah. Yeah, this, uh, I, I think this, there are several archival sources that we, we consulted for this, but this is probably the most important um, because it, it, and really within the logbook, it's only maybe about two pages, I think, but it uh, provides a, a synopsis, an account of that wreck, and um, it, it really formed the basis, I think, for this, this whole sort of narrative that we developed. Um, and kind of jumping to this image, um, Holger and I, when we were sort of trying to work out the sequence of events, um, bearing in mind that you're, uh, you're dealing with something that was written in 1837, uh, some of the prose can be a bit flowery, some of it can be quite vague. Um, so we had to really go through that whole sequence in the logbook. And Holger had the brilliant idea of actually making a visual uh, diagram we could follow. And so what he's done here is he, he shows the position of South Australian, which is the red uh, vessel relative to where it was moored at the time the storm began. Uh, he also shows the rigging, uh, you know, the vessel was preparing to leave. So um, all of its uh, uh, top masts had been put up, um, but there are a sequence of events that occurred during the wrecking event where uh, top masts were, were brought down. They were trying to reduce the top hamper so the vessel didn't uh, rock as much. Uh, and he did a really nice job of, of showing where the ship was as the whole uh, 
uh, wrecking event unfolded. Uh, and in fact, uh, archaeologically, I think that's going to prove quite useful to us later on, because uh, we talked about going back to the site and uh, using Holger's diagram, we may be able to pick up where the anchors and the chains are because he, he did such a really nice job of sort of spelling that out. Yes, for me, it was important to make myself clear what was the position, which anchor was lost, how was the rigging at which time. So uh, I needed to make myself these, these drawings and these sketches to, to really have on every situation at every time, which was mentioned in the logbook, to have a clear uh, overview what was going on, what was happening, uh, which anchor was lost and, and so on. So uh, this was very helpful for me as well to... Uh, <laughs> to develop a story and to show what, where the ship was and what was the position and how it was located, which anchor was lost and stuff. Yeah, right. That was basic. This is one of our, I think this is one of, this is probably the earliest um, layout that we did older, I think, um, which is why I wanted to show it. I thought it was great because it, it kind of, it's not the whole story, yeah. but it's, it's a good sequence, you know, and kind of gives an idea of, you know, where, yeah. where our thought processes were going early on. These were the first sketches of the storyboard. Yeah, you can see I, I lettered it by hand uh, at first. So I, I, I put the text in by hand. And yeah, these were the first stories and they changed uh, with the time. So I always had to communicate with James and showing him uh, these pictures, trying to provide some details as well, which could be mistakes or stuff to make clear uh, what's true, what happened, and that we are really on the right path in the uh, historical sense and we don't speculate uh, too much or make uh, a drama which didn't happen. So the target was really to be as close as possible on the original uh, situation and get the reader immersed into it so he can really feel and sense and the target is that he could smell the salt water and feel the wind and the rain and stuff uh, that's one of the goals uh, of the story to put this into the reader's memory so it helps much more to digest historical uh, contents in a, in a medium like the graphic novel is i think it's a very good medium to tell historical stories and to bring them close to the reader. Yeah, and this is an example for the beginnings, yeah. yes. So one of the challenges that we had is that um, really, with the exception of three individuals, and in this particular image, they're the uh, three guys in the top right-hand corner, um, from left to right, John Pine Marsh Jr., uh, David McLaren in the middle, and John Jeffcott on the right. Uh, we had contemporary depictions of them but they were it. Uh, we, we had no idea what the crew of South Australia looked like. Um, and so there was quite a bit of uh, research that went into looking at the clothing um, of the period, uh, the hairstyles. So what would these guys have worn? Um, they're, not, they're not London dandies. They're working at a whaling station. And, you know, it, it's dirty work. It's hard work. Uh, I can't imagine they would have been wearing their best suits um, but at the same time, you know, appearances mattered back then. So uh, that was kind of an interesting thing, too, uh, working through that. Yes. Uh, I mean, yeah, there are a lot of pictures you can get about fashion at this time and, and stuff, but you have to think on the real situation of the workers, of the guys who were really working hard and they might not have the time to take care on their haircut very much or to uh, wear this uh, suits, these fashions, which were uh, common at this time. So I think they were ordinary clothes, maybe sometimes waist waists where the, the arms were cut off and stuff like that. So I tried to get a lot of inspirations by, by movies. I was uh, looking at one was the modern adaption of Moby Dick where they had an excellent, uh, I think, style of clothing and stuff like that. And this was a big inspiration for me. And I was looking at this movie and I was drawing uh, at the same time and try to get these inspirations out. And uh, this was very helpful. I mean, you need as much inspiration as possible to tell a story like this. You cannot just bear it out of your mind. 
you need uh, inspiration material. And so I got megatons of inspiration material I got from the web, I got from James, and we uh, discussed about that. Is this uh, real? Is this believable? And things like that. And so we came to these characters we have developed for the story, uh, at least. And this is an example yeah, of Probably some one of the most critical characters in the story is, is John McFarlane, who is the captain of South Australia. Um, but we don't really know much about him. That's the tricky bit. Um, he has a very critical role in this entire series of events. But uh, the only thing that we knew about him, and actually, I embarked on a, a fair bit of archival research because of this uh, to try to figure out who this guy was. Uh, what we do know about him was that uh, he was from Tasmania, originally from England. He had immigrated, we think, to Tasmania as a young child with his family. Uh, he was 26 at the time of the wreck, and he was uh, at the whaling station. He was uh, what's called a headsman. So his job was to kill the whale. Uh, he, he would be in the whaling boat, and uh, when the whale was harpooned, you know, they, they would drag the boat until it was fatigued, and he would be the one who would sort of deliver the coup de grace to the, to the whale. Uh, so, yeah, he was young. He would have had to have been fairly fit, uh, pretty strong uh, to do that kind of work. And so, yeah, he was interesting, uh, just trying to work out what he was going to look like. Yeah, it's, uh, if you uh, if you develop a character for a graphic novel, it's always very helpful to work with movie actors or with films and stuff like that. For example, one of my favorite draws, Möbius, he was uh, taking Jean-Paul Belmondo as a hero for his Lieutenant Blueberry story, a Western story he was uh, drawing for a long time. And so I was looking at different movies, uh, which actor would fit uh, into the role of uh, John McFarlane. And at first I was choosing Robert De Niro, who is one of my favorite actors, but the movies I had for, uh, from him, he was quite too old. We discovered then uh, uh, that McFarlane was quite about 26, 27 at this time. And so the pictures I had from De Niro, were, he was too old. So I had to look for another character and I was looking different movies. I found one in the German uh, version of the modern German version of the Sea Wolf, a story from Jack London. Uh, and there was Christian, no, Sebastian Koch is uh, the name of the actor. But I changed him a bit because I didn't like his nose. <laughs> so I changed his nose a bit. Because, as we know, John McFarlane, he was a, a whaler, a headsman. He was quite a, a strong guy and, and a, a hardworking guy. So he was not the kind of sophisticated fashion uh, guy. So uh, this was the, a character that fitted into, the, into this role. And this is the result of him. And I did several sketches with different moods. Uh, to get close to this character. You do have to get into this character uh, as a comic artist, uh, as a graphic novel artist, and uh, yeah, get the feeling for this guy and for this personality. Yeah. Right, and this... Uh, yeah, we're, and we're, pretty, we're pretty fortunate. While we didn't have um, you know, contemporary depictions of the crew, uh, we did have several of the whaling station at, at Rosetta Harbor, and that was pretty helpful uh, because it enabled Holger to sort of visually conceptualize how it would have looked. Um, you know, it was a very, very frontier, uh, you know, we were talking about, you know, structures that were kind of slapped together, tents, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, but thankfully, we had uh, at least, uh, I think we had probably about a half a dozen contemporary depictions of the whaling station that we could work with. So that, that helped a yeah. lot. I remember we had one picture I found in the internet which showed uh, the SAC whaling station with carcass uh, in the foreground and stuff like that. And I sent it to James and he said to me, oh, no, this guy didn't do his homework uh, because there's no carcass uh, on the shore. It was processed uh, on the vessel, as James was telling before. And there was no windmill and things like that. And so... 
we always had to draw pictures, discuss about them and find uh, what was right, what was wrong and distill it into the, into the right picture which matches the true situation uh, how it was in this time in the 19th century. Yeah, no carcasses this time, I'm sure that was. <laughs> oh, we had to whittle that one down a bit. Um, so this is, a, I, I love this series of images. This was the first time you experimented with uh, colors. Yes. Uh, yeah, these were the I first. I was completely floored by it. It was just really cool, like the way you sort of captured the, the weather, you know, and the whole mood of it. Yes, when we had decided that we start with the loss, with this story, I tried to find out a style and I was experimenting with different styles to find out how will the, re the final style uh, will be. And this were some experiments uh, I did. And so through these experiments, I came to the style which we are working with now. At the moment, it's a foreground with markers and uh, stuff and the backgrounds with watercolor and aquarels. So we got we got uh, uh, a tension between, I mean, the foreground, which is very pregnant and very precise and shows uh, the, the stuff very clear, and the background, which is quite chaotic and has some um, some own dynamics with the colors who are flowing. And so I get this sense of the clouds and the storm and this this uh, yeah this stormy situation when the bark was crashing onto the reef and uh, these are some examples yeah yeah one of the things i really liked was some of the sound effects that you came up with for you know the sound of the hull hitting the reef because it's yeah brack was one you know i don't know it's it's really evocative stuff it's really cool um yeah i think you've got another one you know, you know just yeah i and all these really interesting noises and it's you know they seem you know you look at them and you go oh, that's that's kind of weird but then you, you you know you make the sound and you go oh, yeah that actually kind of would sound like that so yeah it's great yeah so these, um we've got a series of images here so this is kind of as things are starting to progress from that initial uh storyboard layout and you can sort of start to see things evolve a bit um with McFarland, uh, you know, there at the stern, kind of looking off at the lee shore and realizing that they're in a whole heap of trouble, and I kind of pulled yes. away. Yeah, for me, it was a it was camera move. Uh, the camera is going backwards slowly, so it starts from Captain McFarland. It goes back. Uh, it shows the ship. Then we go away from the ship. We, we see the whole bark. Then we move over the water surface, we see the chains, the anchor chains, uh, which are strapped really uh, as hell. And then we go over the buoy and we end up on an overview of the encounter bay where we can see the whole situation. We can see the location of the vessel. We can see the reef where it's located. And uh, yeah, so that was kind of an introduction, which is quite a bit filmic uh, in my opinion, film-like. Uh, and the comic, uh, the graphic novel, it has a lot of relations with movies, with film. We are working with image uh, sequences. We have a flow of storytelling, uh, which has to proceed. And it's a, a very active kind of perception uh, when you look at a graphic novel, because you always interpolate between the chain of images. Um, this happens in your mind. So the chain of images is drawing your story inside yourself. And when we see pictures in a, a graphic novel, it activates patterns of action in ourselves so that we internally redo the whole story. And this gives a, a great memory as well. So it's a very good medium to transport historic contents. And that's one of the qualities of a graphic novel, I think, that it can transport this, this kind of contents uh, very well. And this active kind of perception uh, makes the user really consuming this thing uh, very immersive. And so uh, you get this deeper in your mind than if you would just read an article or things like that. And so a graphic novel is an ideal medium to transport historic contents, in my opinion. This one, I think, kind of encapsulates 
that. I like this because we we put Pine Marsh, McLaren, and Jeffcon in there. You know, we knew they were on the vessel. We knew they were probably at the stern. Uh, you know, them being uh, important passengers, um, and they probably got. It's probably a bit of a hell ride for those guys. <laughs> I'd imagine they would have kept them below decks, I think, as this was all unfolding and they were probably getting thrown around everywhere. Um, and the thing I like about this image is that it, it's a really great segue image for, I think, the discussion of archeology span uh, and another issue. Uh, you know, you've got plates coming off the racks and smashing everywhere. And certainly we've got ceramics on the wreck site, um, you know, and who knows, they, they could have been, in, in fact, some of them probably were in the stern, uh, you know, and, uh, May have been smashed up or probably were in, were in the wrecking unit so that's pretty exciting um yeah that like, was quite inspiring because of the ceramics and the original findings we could put in the story so that's how it worked and so we we we, uh, we put in uh, a certain uh, knowledge about findings and things in the story and this makes it uh, also i think believable and, and immersive I like right. this one quite a bit um, because we're, we're, we're looking at because South Australian hit Black Reef stern first and it, at that point had two anchors out. It had it lost one of its bower anchors. Uh, the starboard anchor was gone, but it, it had the port bower anchor still. It was hanging on um, and it also had a stream anchor out off the stern. Um, the stream anchor was, was a rope. It was on a hawser. It wasn't on a chain. Um, and yeah, I really like this because when South Australian hits the reef and starts to slide over that, that hauser just breaks, it snaps. And um, so yeah, I like how you did this sequence. It was really fun trying to kind of work this one out. Because um, we figured South Australian had a windlass. Uh, we're pretty sure of that. And that they were feeding chain through this windlass. But of course, you know, they're, they're trying to feed as much of it out. McFarland made a conscious effort to try to get over the reef. He realized if he could get over the reef into calmer water, they had a better chance of surviving. So he was paying out that bow anchor as much as he could to try to get over that reef. Um, and it turns out he, he had just enough. <laughs> but I think it was probably the fact that that stream anchor line broke at the end might have might have actually helped them in the end. Yes, and I think he did very well in this case to save his crew and his ship. Uh, in this case, it could have been much worse if we would have uh, shown other reactions. And I think this was a life-saving idea to bend the anchor chains together and stuff. And this is quite an interesting part of the story as well. So well, there are a lot of interesting, uh, interesting events and parts which make the story, uh, I think, active and, and believable. But yeah, this is the deployment of the stream anchor off the stern. Um, and they, we know that they, they actually transported the anchor some distance from the stern of the ship. So again, you know, we don't have precise detail. We're kind of working on our knowledge of you know, what people did back then. And the most likely scenario was that they actually lowered the anchor into a boat uh, and they used the boat to transfer the anchor some distance off the stern and, and drop it, uh, at which point they could try to uh, take up yeah. the line and set it. Um, I just yeah, this is one. The, the left being your initial sort of concept sketch and the right being the final um, and how, how it evolved. It's just really amazing. Yeah, that's fine. That's one of my favorite uh, so far at the, at the moment. It shows this sequence where they are putting the stream the anchor out, and in this time you didn't have motors or something who could drive you out of the catastrophe or out of the drama. The only way you could get a ship which was uh, crashed at a sandbank or something, the only way to get it out was to get a, an anchor out and uh, get it a uh, far distance from the ship and then try to with muscle power to tear your ship out of this uh, situation and this happened quite uh, a lot of times. I'm really mad about uh, ship stories and I have read a lot of 
this stuff about Ch James Cook, about uh, Abel Tasman and, and all these explorers in the 19th century. I'm really very interested in this. And I think that's also a reason which got us together uh, on this kind of projects because I'm really a, a freak of this explorer stories of the early 19th and 18th century, which is where you could explore new worlds and an amazing time, I think. A very interesting time. So these are just yeah. some of the, uh, the final uh, versions now that uh, produced. And yeah, that just, I'm just blown away. Every time I get one from you, you know, by email, it's like a little, it's like a little gift. You know? <laughs> I just love it because it's, it's really nice to sort of see what's written in that log book um, be depicted, uh, you know, so beautifully, I think, uh, in, in this form. So, yeah, and of course now, we have, you know, we've got McFarland down there in the lower lower left. So he's, he's sort of coming together as a character. And yeah, I, I really like how you capture the, the, the seas. I mean, the sea state, um, on contemporary accounts record that from Rosetta Head, which is this sort of massive headland, uh, back to Wright Island, uh, which is a fairly large island on the other side of the bay, yeah, they described it as being white. It was completely white with foam. Like you, you couldn't, you couldn't even make out individual waves. It was just, you know, smashing into that anchorage, and uh, no ship really was going to survive that. So yeah, it's great to see that and how you captured that. Um, yeah, thanks. This is the intro, which is kind of cool um, as well. I, I realize we're, we're getting close to time here. So um, yeah, I really, uh, so what we've done is we, uh, Holger and I have worked on an introduction. So it kind of sets the scene, you know, it's 1837. Uh, we briefly talk about some of the things going on around the world and, and uh, then kind of segue into a discussion of South Australian company and, and why South Australia was there to begin with. And then yes, in, and it's a goal on in, this introduction to get the reader immersed into this time. So I, I had I chose an action scene where this guy is shouting something. I showed the vessel, I showed a harbor scene at this time. So to transport the reader at the beginning into this to get a sense of this time how it was how things were looking like and, and give, providing information about this time as well because it was quite before before charles darwin uh, or, no it was just uh, charles darwin had just returned from his four years uh, travel so we can see that his ideas hadn't been just in the world at this time when we uh, describe our story. So it's also important to know what was going on in the minds of the people at this time. They believed in religion and there were Protestants and Lutherans uh, in England, for example, or Germans who ex escaped from, from the Kaiser's rules, which where he tried to put the Lutherans and the Protestants together into one religion. and things like that. So all these historical backgrounds were important to understand uh, how we want, how we develop the story and how to get in and to get the sense of this time and the feeling of this time. This was important to get as much in inspiration as possible. Yeah. So, uh, so the graphic novel uh, the issue that we've worked on up to this point uh, purely deals with the wrecking event. Uh, so it's just the account of the loss um, one thing that we're hoping to do, though, is to do additional issues of this. And of course, one of the topics we're quite keen uh, to, to tackle is the actual archaeology uh, and, you know, sort of uh, drawing uh, a connection between what we found archaeologically and, and what's mentioned in historical accounts. And, um, so I'm just showing a few images here. These are kind of fun because these were sketches that Holger generated from actual photographs from on the fieldwork. Um, and, uh, so that's yeah, cool. that was our first intention to uh, make the first episode, make the discovery of the bark. But uh, before we studied the logbooks and found out, okay, there are four more episodes and what's the decision which, which episode we want to start with. 
So we took the drama at first, but this will be also one episode we want to uh, visualize a, a later step uh, to show the discovery. Um, at the beginning, we started with the discovery and here we can see some of these images about the discovery of the ship, which will be a story of its own uh, at the end, once we have told other stories <laughs> from the logbook. Right. That, uh, that image on the right is I think actually the, the one of the first first sketches you did, I think. Uh, uh, yeah. Working on this, uh, it's fantastic. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. This. Uh, this is, uh, it's, it's pretty apropos actually, because this, this is a mineral water bottle uh, that we found on the rec site and it was produced in Germany of all places. Um, so it's, uh, now we know that there were Germans aboard South Australian. Uh, there was a small group of Germans that came over uh, they were predominantly uh, flax growers and vine dressers, so they had a background in, in the wine industry. Um, and it, it does raise some interesting questions, you know, this this bottle of German, or this German mineral water bottle, you know, did it belong to one of those Germans uh, who was aboard the vessel? And it's hard to say, but it raises some fairly tantalizing questions. And I think as we move forward with this, uh, hopefully be able to illustrates, if you'll pardon the pun, uh, a little bit more of that. Um, so I think at this point, um, we're moving to the Q&A now. All right, yes. And Kieran is now back. Right. Uh, thank you, James. Thank you, Holger. Now we have quite a number of questions to ask you to, and uh, I'll go through them now. There's a stack of them, by the way. <laughs> Lots of enthusiasm. All right. Good. This is a, a question first for, uh, for James, and this is from Heather. Uh, you, James, you said that there was, there was more of the ship uncovered between the two years of survey. Do you expect this trend to continue? Unfortunately, I would say yes. Um, we had a very interesting sort of phenomenon occur on the RAC site. Uh, we noticed when we were there in, in 2018, uh, I think it was on our second uh, expedition or possibly the third, but we, we noticed that there seemed to be a depletion of uh, seagrass. Uh, so what the wreck site was buried under for many, many years was sand uh, that was being held together by these rather large seagrass beds. And unfortunately, the seagrass appears to be dying. Uh, we don't know why, don't know what the cause is, could be any one of a number of things, but unfortunately, as the seagrass is dying, it's causing it, nothing's holding the sand together now. So it's just starting to deflate. And as a consequence of that, it's moving off the wreck site. Um, so one thing we have noted is there has been some sediment movement um, from the port side uh, over towards the starboard side. So uh, parts of the wreck that were exposed uh, in April 2018 on the starboard side are now buried, but sections that were fairly well buried when we found the wreck are now completely exposed. So um, I, I don't know whether we've got a complete blowout of the whole wreck or maybe it's just sediment migrating, but we'd really like to get back on the wreck soon so we can get to the bottom of that. Great, thank you. Um, this question's uh, from Robert, and it's uh, directed also at James. Uh, Robert asks, is this the most recent wreck search in Australian waters? Do you know, James? Ooh, most recent. I don't think so. <laughs> um, it's certainly fairly recent, uh, you know, only, only a, you know, a couple of years ago. Um, but... Um, there, I mean, there have been other projects that have been ongoing. Uh, and I know Flinders, uh, our colleagues at Flinders, for example, have been doing some work uh, in Victoria and also in South Australia. So uh, those are probably more recent than South Australian, but it's certainly one of the more recent ones. Yeah. We also have the work done on the Barangaroo boat, True. also, which is on land. Yes. Um, and another question, this is from Anonymous, by the way. Uh, I always like Anonymous questions. They're not swearing at either of you. <laughs> uh, so the question is, and it's a good question, why do you preserve old shipwrecks? What's, what's the thing about preserving shipwrecks? What do you learn from them? For James and Holger, really? Yeah, um, I would say that, you know, there are details that 
you get from material culture. Uh, in the case, well, South Australia is a good example. Um, you know, it's it's a mail packet. This is a fairly common vessel built in the 19th century. Thing is, we know very little about them. There's not very much in the historical record that describes how they were built, how they were designed. Um, we've got general descriptions, but in terms of the actual minute detail of how they were framed and what fasteners were used and we don't have any of those details. And South Australian is actually providing that information for the first time. It's actually the first um, 19th century uh, packet uh, of that vintage that's been investigated archeologically. So there's a lot there, I think that we're able to uh, extract out of it now and in the future as we go forward. Fantastic. Um, I've got a question, very similar question. One's from Lucas and one's from Emma. So I'll run them both together. So and this one, this, this question is directed at Holger. Uh, so do you have a name yet for the graphic novel? And has it been published? Because I really like to read it. <laughs> yes, that's a good question. Uh, thanks. Uh, the name of this episode we are uh, working at the moment is called The Lost, but the overall title for the series uh, is South Australian, the story of a ship in brackets wreck. And um, that's uh, the original title, uh, which was for it. Um, uh, we are working at the moment. We are discussing. We have sent it to uh, first publishers and uh, we will send it to other publishers as well. We want to be finished uh, by next year with this and we hope we can get it released uh, by next year probably at the end of next year because the process of printing and and editing and stuff will take some time. But uh, yeah, we are about to uh, send it out to publish. Fantastic. Absolutely great. I'm looking forward to it, by the way. <laughs> and I see this <laughs> is more know. than one. There'll be a couple of these in a row. Uh, so I've got a uh, also a question. It was not really a question. It's from Fiona. And Fiona is actually very impressed, Holger, with your wonderful imagery. And she sees Thanks, touches, touches of uh, Turner and she loves your characterization of the people. And I must admit, whenever, whenever James opens his emails and he shows me another one, I get quite blown away as well. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks guys. We have a couple of questions from Lindsay. Uh, so Lindsay, first of all, first of all said it's a fantastic presentation, but also she's, it's a question for James. Were any artifacts raised from the wreck of the South Australian and if so, where are they now? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, we did recover a small number of artifacts in 2019. Uh, we had a few glass bottles that were intact and we thought, ooh, those are a, a little little too, uh, you know, <laughs> I can see somebody swimming along going, ooh, I'd like to grab that. Um, so we made the decision um, to recover them. So we mapped them in place and, and, and documented them and removed them. Uh, we had one diagnostic ceramic shard um, that was called Willow Pattern, uh, which is very uh, late 18th, early 19th century, so uh, right time period. Um, and it was, it was pretty much that. It was glass and ceramic. Uh, and we did recover one of the gun flints, too. Um, uh, but we kept the recovery fairly minimal. Uh, we, were, we were trying not to do too much of that. Uh, and anything that could be reburied, we re reburied. Uh, all of those artifacts at the moment are at Art Lab in Adelaide. Um, Art Lab has an arrangement with the South Australian Maritime Museum to conserve artifacts. Um, I suspect that those artifacts will probably end up in, in the Maritime Museum's collection over there. So um, they're doing all that conservation work right now. This is right. Thank you, James. This is a general sort of observation uh, from Judith. And she's saying what an absolutely wonderful collaboration. She's a, a teacher librarian and a museum educator and also a history student. And she just thinks this is the perfect teaching tool. And I must admit is one way of getting uh, younger people to become interested in history and archeology. span We always want young arcs um, and also young interpreters of, of the past. So this is a fantastic collaboration that they're obviously very pleased to see happening between a fantastic graphic artist and also an archaeologist of some note. <laughs> thank you. oh, you're too kind. Yeah, <laughs> thank you, though. I mean, it, it's it is pretty awesome. I mean, I, I, you know, it's one of those things that, again, before we started, it was kind of just spinning around my head like, what if, you know, I didn't 
Um, but it was just such good fortune that Holger and I had worked together on this VR thing and we just got to talking and realized, wow, we've got this thing in common and we could totally do this. Um, so yeah, it's great to hear. I'm glad to see that um, people think it, it could be useful and uh, I'd love to do more of it. <laughs> It'd be great. Yeah, me too. Absolutely. There's lots of shipwrecks, heaps of them. You can, yeah, you can, you can do them on <laughs> that sort of That sort of leads into the next question from Joanne who asks, why did you choose the South Australian shipwreck when there's so many other shipwreck stories out there? So is it just happy stance or? Oh, I don't know. I think no. it's, yeah, I, I think it, <laughs> from my perspective, yeah, oh, go ahead, Holger, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, well, I, I think it's it's very important because it what was one of the first uh, vessels in South Australia which brought immigrants to Kangaroo Island and, and things. So it's, it's a very important historic uh, wreck, I think, because of this uh, fact uh, that, and this will be an interesting story for us as well, when the, the immigration of 62 passengers with a lot of goats and chicken and oxes and whatever they had on board to, uh, to feed the passengers, they took four months and went over South Africa uh, with a stop in Port Elizabeth in between, and they got into a storm, into a gale. A child died in this uh, in this episode, and there was also some beatings of the crew, uh, where they punched somehow each other. So I think this was will be a, a more dialogue story where we find out a lot more about the personalities of the passengers and of the people uh, as this story we did now is an action story a drama where it has uh, all the people have to act as quick as possible to save their lives and there was not much time to have a philosophic dialogue or something in between which will happen in the immigrant story i think we can have a lot of interesting dialogues at this four months travel uh, what these people uh, did and the Lutherans and the Protestants from Germany who escaped uh, because of their religion and things like that will be an, an interesting story as well I think very interesting fantastic and again that leads into the next question what is your next project or future collaboration because they, they people are finding it a very exciting uh, format this is from Amelia hmm. so what is your <laughs> next project or collaboration do you know will you work get this one out of the way well, first I think there are several options uh, we have. Uh, there are ideas uh, we have. We have not decided what will be uh, at least the next one, but we are bringing this to an end first. And in the meantime, we are developing uh, the next project. There are several things also in the area of virtual reality. Uh, what we did before, we have options to uh, make, I say, amazing virtual dives to to uh, interesting shipwrecks and also we have this immigration story uh, we can start on so I think there's a lot of material for us uh, we can develop it's just a question of the decision we make what will be our next one but I think our our cooperation our collaboration is quite fruitable because if you do projects like this you need to trust each other because uh, this is a very important fact. I couldn't do this with somebody I couldn't trust because we have to discuss. Sometimes we have to change things and there's so much uh, to do. And I think this is a very lucky a lucky constellation between uh, James, James and I because we share common interests. We are both interested in submarine worlds and uh, early explorers in the 19th century. And so, so many things which fit together which make an ideal constellation, I think, uh, to make projects like this we have been doing. That cannot happen with every everybody, I think. It's it's a special thing when things fit together. It is together. a special thing. It is a special thing. Yeah. Absolutely, is, I would say. <laughs> thank you, Holger. This is a question for James. Um, is there any possibility of, of bodies being found in the wreck of the South Australian? And uh, what is the etiquette, etiquette around the work that you do if you do find human remains remains um thankfully the answer with south australia is no uh, there were no fatalities on the ship everybody got off it um it ended up in very shallow water and even though it was challenging to get everyone off safely they did manage to do it so thankfully we don't have to worry about that um 
I have worked on one project where we did have the crew uh, skeletal. Uh, we had the remains, and the way we dealt with them because it was a an American Civil War submarine uh, is that we we treated them uh, like mm -hmm. modern service personnel. Uh, we didn't. Uh, we had uh, live webcams going during the excavation, and we turned them off whenever we took the remains out. Didn't show photos of them. Um, just didn't try to sensationalize it. Uh, you know, there was information uh, that was really critical to our understanding who these men were, but we we tried to remain very, um, you know, scientific, uh, maintain very strict protocol about, you know, keeping uh, any images sort of ghoulish stuff um, out of the out of the public realm. Right. Thanks, James. And the next question is from Dave. And Dave states that the novel mentioned the South Australian was transporting the years taken from the whaling station. Uh, Dave assumes that this material was mostly lost. What was the effect of the loss of the station? Did it continue after the loss of the South Australian or did it just disappear because of the loss of capital? Um, it did continue. Uh, they lost, um, you know, they would have lost, I'm not sure how much of the whale oil. Uh, they also had whale bone. Uh, they, those are the two main uh, bits of produce they were carrying um it, so it, it was it was a definite hit uh it was hit uh, it was a hit to the, the station but they did persist uh at least for a few more years but um <laughs> what was going on at the time was that there was a, a couple of other whaling stations that popped up in the neighborhood and um some fairly stiff competition and uh, as a consequence of that the, the south australian company eventually closed the station there that was that ahead. Right, thanks. Uh, I've got a question from SJ. SJ is talking about, there's a Maritime Archaeological Association in Victoria, and it's very active. Do you know if there's a similar organization in New South Wales or South Australia? Uh, there is an avocational organization in South Australia. Um, it's, uh, it was kind of deactivated for a while and they've, they've just started up again and they've got a new name. Uh, I'm not sure what their new name is, but uh, they, ha they have been renewed and reinvigorated. So that's that's good. I can see them probably starting to do more work. And uh, I believe they're they're working with Flinders University, uh, the Maritime Archaeology Program there. Um, and also, I, I don't know, Karen, I'd have to ask you about the status of the one in New South Wales, whether it's still functional or not. One's in, one's in New South Wales uh, sort of stopped working you know, 10 or 15 years ago. There was one in Sydney and one in Newcastle. I don't think a new one has started up. There is a number of marine biological rather than marine archaeological associations, and they work out of the Australian Museum in College Street. They've got a number of dive clubs working there. They do biological analysis and reef spot, reef checks and all that sort of stuff. There's also an organisation called GERT, that does do work Australia-wide, that's G-I-R-T, and you might be able to find information online about if there's GERT practitioners in New South Wales. I don't know if there is, but they may well be. Yeah. Another comment from Emma, just basically saying that your illustrations are beautiful, Holger. Um, and the idea of rendering, the rendering of water and clothing is superb. And a question from me is, um, how many, this is, this is your first, second, third graphic novel, because you're obviously a very, very well-developed artist. So um, is this the first one that you've actually produced, or is there others that we should look for? <laughs> well, uh, it's a long time ago. In my student years, uh, I was doing a graphic novel about the uh, times of the 1920s in Germany and the upcoming national socialism and uh, things like that. So, yeah, that was an early uh, graphic novel in my student time where I also did a lot of research about clothes. And yeah, so uh, I remember this, these early works uh, as a student when I was good diving into this uh, story. And this went much deeper, I think, in case of research and in case of, of experiments and of trying finding the style and all, all this stuff. So, I mean, this is my first... I say a professional realized uh, graphic novel 
uh, I was doing since my student years, you can say. Yeah. I went to animation then and mm -hmm. went into 3D and stuff. So there was not so much opportunity to do graphic, graphic novels uh, again. I did some storyboarding uh, at that time, but this is really my first graphic novel after a long, long time, I can say. Fantastic. And I'm happy to have this opportunity. <laughs> I, I, just, I just like this weird thing that we've got a person, a graphic artist in Germany, working with an archaeologist in Sydney to produce a graphic novel on a shipwreck in South Australia. I just like the way the world works at times. <laughs> and and yeah, one, well. last, <laughs> one last question. Uh, this is from, uh, from Matthew. There's plenty more in the chat, but we're running out of time. So sure. this question is from Matthew. Uh, were any of the artifacts recovered from people who actually dove the wreck in the 1940s and 50s? Do you know that, James? And if, they, um, and if they were recovered, do you know where they are? No, I don't believe so. Uh, there, well, there have been a handful of artifacts that have been turned over uh, to the state, um, to what's the Department for Environment and Water, that's the South Australian agency that regulates uh, shipwreck sites. Um, some of those artifacts were handed over uh, purportedly from South Australian, but quite interestingly, uh, these were bolts. Um, uh, one of our colleagues, uh, Wendy Van Dyvenvoort at uh, Flinders University, she did copper analysis of the fasteners. Uh, we sampled some fasteners from the wreck site, and she compared that with fasteners that had been turned in purportedly from South Australia, and they don't match. So those artifacts that were handed in years ago are from a different wreck site. Um, Supposedly, there were um, there were reports of ceramic plates, like complete ceramic plates and stuff like that, that were recovered in the 40s. But um, I, I've never seen any of that stuff, and I don't believe uh, Rick Bullers, who uh, is a maritime heritage officer in South Australia, he's been able to find them either. But they could be floating around the community somewhere. I'd love to find them. That'd be great. <laughs> if anyone who's watching this is from <laughs> Victor Harbor, <laughs> and you know where they are. <laughs> well, we'll start wrapping up the session now. There's many more questions in the chat, many of them associated with uh, the beauty of your drawings, Holger, and what a fantastic collaboration it is, and what a unique way of interpreting shipwrecks. So we will get round to answering those people's questions as the evening progresses. There's some that I can answer and some I'll pass on to James and Holger. But thank you everyone for joining us today to hear about the South Australian shipwreck and the, the graphic, the new graphic way of, of interpreting archaeology and history and a soon, hopefully soon to be released uh, graphic novel. Uh, thank you, Dr. James Hunter and Professor Holger Boiter for your presentation this evening, this afternoon, sorry. And also thank you for the, the people running around in the background. I'd like to thank uh, Laura and Nerida who have been handling the back end of the chat this afternoon. We do actually have another series of presentations coming up in the next uh, month or so. The next one is next Tuesday, the 5th of October, and that is called Save Our Seas, How to Secure the Ocean's Future. And that's a presentation by two of the museum's uh, curators working in the environment sphere, Emily Chatif and Cave Lee Bartnick. Anyway, thank you all for joining us. I hope you enjoyed this evening's afternoon's session. Thank you.